The snow image. A childish miracle one afternoon of a cold winter's day, when the sun shone forth. With chilly brightness, after a long storm, two children asked leave of their mother to run out and play in the new fallen snow. The elder child was a little girl, whom, because she was of a tender and modest disposition, and was thought to be very beautiful, her parents, and other people who were familiar with her, used to call Violet. But her brother was known by the style and title of Peony, on account of the ruddiness of his broad and round little fizz, which made everybody think of sunshine and great scarlet flowers. The father of these two children, a certain Mr. Lindsay, it is important to say, was an excellent but exceedingly matter-of-fact sort of man, a dealer in hardware, and was sturdily accustomed to take what is called the common-sense view of all matters. That came under his consideration. With a heart about as tender as other people's, he had a head as hard and impenetrable, and therefore, perhaps, as empty, as one of the iron pots which it was a part of his business to sell. The mother's character, on the other hand, had a strain of poetry in it, a trait of unworldly beauty, a delicate and dewy flower, as it were, that had survived out of her imaginative youth, and still kept itself alive amid the dusty realities of matrimony and motherhood. So, Violet and Peony, as I began with saying, besought their mother to let them run out and play in the new snow for, though it had looked so dreary and dismal, drifting downward out of the grey sky, it had a very cheerful aspect, now that the sun was shining on it. The children dwelt in a city, and had no wider playplace than a little garden before the house, divided by a white fence from the street, and with a pear tree and two or three plum trees overshadowing it, and some rose bushes just in front of the parlour windows. The trees and shrubs, however, were now leafless, and their twigs were enveloped in the light snow, which thus made a kind of wintry foliage, with here and there a pendant icicle for the fruit. And Quat, yes, Violet, yes, my little peony, and Quat, said their kind mother, and Quat, you may go out and play in the new snow. And Quat, Accordingly, the good lady bundled up her darlings in woolen jackets and wadded sacks, and put comforters round their necks, and a pair of striped gaiters on each little pair of legs, and worsted mittens on their hands, and gave them a kiss apiece, by way of a spell to keep away Jack Frost. Forth sallied the two children, with a hop, skip, and jump, that carried them at once into the very heart of a huge snowdrift whence Violet emerged like a snowbunting, while little Peony floundered out with his round face in full bloom. Then what a merry time had they, too. Look at them, frolicking in the wintry garden, you would have thought that the dark and pitiless storm had been sent for no other purpose but to provide a new plaything for Violet and Peony, and that they themselves had been created, as the snowbirds were, to take delight only in the tempest and in the white mantle which it spread over the earth. At last, when they had frosted one another, all over with handfuls of snow, Violet, after laughing heartily at little Peony's figure, was struck with a new idea. And Quat, you look exactly like a snow image, Peony, and Quat, said she, and Quat, if your cheeks were not so red. And that puts me in mind. Let us make an image out of snow, an image of a little girl, and it shall be our sister, and shall run about and play with us all winter. Long. Won't it be nice? And quat. And quat. Oh yes. And quat. Cried Peony, as plainly as he could speak, for he was but a little boy. And quat. That will be nice. And mama shall see it. And quat. And quat. Yes. And quat answered Violet, and Quat, Mama shall see the new little girl. But she must not make her come into the warm parlor, for, you know, our little snow sister will not love the warmth, and Quat, and forthwith. The children began this great business of making a snow image that should run about, 
while there. Mother, who was sitting at the window and overheard some of their talk, could not help smiling at the gravity with which they said about it. They really seemed to imagine that there would be no difficulty whatever in creating a live little girl out of the snow. And, to say the truth, if miracles are ever to be wrought, it will be by putting our hands to the work in precisely such a simple and undoubting frame of mind as that in which Violet and Peony now undertook to perform one, without so much as knowing that it was a miracle. So thought the mother, and thought, likewise, that the new snow, just fallen from heaven, would be excellent material to make new beings of, if it were not so very cold. She gazed at the children a moment longer, delighting to watch their little figures, the girl, tall for her age, graceful and agile, and so delicately colored that she looked like a cheerful thought more than a physical reality, while Peony expanded in breadth rather than height, and rolled along on his short and sturdy legs as substantial as an elephant, though not quite so big. Then the mother resumed her work. What it was I forget, but she was either trimming a silken bonnet for Violet, or darning a pair of stockings for little Peony's short legs. Again, however, and again, and yet other agains, she could not help turning her head to the window to see how the children got on with their snow image. Indeed, it was an exceedingly pleasant sight, those bright little souls at their task. Moreover, it was really wonderful to observe how Knowingly and skillfully they managed the matter. Violet assumed the chief direction, and told Peony what to do, while, with her own delicate fingers, she shaped out all the nicer parts of the snow figure. It seemed, in fact, not so much to be made by the children, as to grow up under their hands, while they were playing and prattling about it. Their mother was quite surprised at this. And the longer she looked, the more and more surprised she grew. And quot, what remarkable children mine are, and quot, thought she, smiling with a mother's pride, and, smiling at herself, too, for being so proud of them. And quot, what other children could have made anything so like a little girl's figure out of snow at the first trial? Well, but now I must finish Peony's new frock, for his grandfather is coming tomorrow, and I want the little fellow to look handsome. And quat, so she took up the frock, and was soon as busily at work again with her needle as the two children with their snow image. But still, as the needle traveled hither and thither through the seams of the dress, the mother made her toil light and happy by listening to the airy voices of Violet and Peony. They kept talking to one another all the time, their tongues being quite as active as their feet and hands. Except at intervals, she could not distinctly hear what was said, but had merely a sweet impression that they were in a most loving mood, and were enjoying themselves highly, and that the business of making the snow image went prosperously on. Now and then, however, when Violet in Peony happened to raise their voices, the words were as audible as if they had been spoken in the very parlor where the mother sat. Oh how delightfully those words echoed in her heart, even though they meant nothing so very wise or wonderful, after all. But you must know a mother listens with her heart much more than with her ears, and thus she is often delighted with the trills of celestial music, when other people can hear nothing of the kind. And quat, peony, peony, and quat, cried Violet to her brother, who had gone to another part of the garden, and quat, bring me some of that fresh snow, peony, from the very farthest corner, where we have not been trampling. I wanted to shape our little snow sister's bosom with. You know that part must be quite pure, just as it came out of the sky, and quat, and quat. Here it is, Violet, and quat, answered Peony, in his bluff tone, but a very sweet tone, too, as he came floundering through the half-trodden drifts. And quat, here is the snow for her little bosom. Oh Violet, how boaty full she begins to look, and quat, and quat, yes, and quat.
said Violet, thoughtfully and quietly, and quat. Our snow sister does look very lovely. I did not quite know, Peony, that we could make such a sweet little girl as this. And quat. The mother, as she listened, thought how fit and delightful an incident it would be, if fairies, or still better, if Angel children were to come from paradise, and play invisibly with her own darlings, and help them to make their snow image, giving it the features of celestial babyhood. Violet and Peony would not be aware of their immortal playmates, only they would see that the image grew very beautiful while they worked at it, and would think that they themselves had done it all. And quat, my little girl in Boy deserve such playmates, if mortal children ever did. And quat, said the mother to herself, and then. She smiled again at her own motherly pride. Nevertheless, the idea seized upon her imagination. And, ever and anon, she took a glimpse out of the window, half dreaming that she might see the. Golden-haired children of paradise sporting with her own golden-haired violet and bright-cheeked. Peony. Now, for a few moments, there was a busy and earnest, but indistinct hum of the two children's voices, as Violet and Peony wrought together with one happy consent. Violet still seemed to be the guiding spirit, while Peony acted rather as a laborer, and brought her the snow from far and near. And yet the little urchin evidently had a proper understanding of the matter. 2. And quat, Peony, Peony and quat, cried Violet, for her brother was again at the other side of the garden, and quat, bring me those light wreaths of snow that have rested on the lower branches of the pear tree, you can clamber on the snowdrift, peony, and reach them easily, I must have them to make, some ringlets for our snow sister's head, and quat, and quat, here they are, Violet, and quat, answered the little boy, and quat, take care you do not break them. Well done, well done, how pretty, and quat, and quat, does she not look sweetly? And quat, said Violet, with a very satisfied tone. And quat, and now we must have some little shining bits of ice, to make the brightness of her eyes. She is not finished yet. Mama will see how very beautiful she is, but Papa will say, tush. Nonsense. Come in out of the cold. And quat. And quat. Let us call Mama to look out. And quat. Said Peony. And then he shouted lustily. And quat. Mama. 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 Look out. And see what a nice. It'll. Girl we are making. And quat. The mother put down her work for an instant. And looked out of the. Window. But it so happened that the sun. For this was one of the shortest days of the whole year, had sunken so nearly to the edge of the world that his setting shine came obliquely into the lady's eyes. So she was dazzled, you must understand, and could not very distinctly observe what was in the garden. Still, however, through all that bright, blinding dazzle of the sun and the new snow, she beheld a small white figure in the garden, that seemed to have a wonderful deal of human likeness about it and she saw Violet and Peony, indeed, she looked more at them than at the image, she saw the two children still at work, Peony bringing fresh snow, and Violet applying it to the figure as scientifically as a sculptor adds clay to his model. Indistinctly as she discerned the snow child, the mother thought to herself that never before was there a snow figure so cunningly made, nor ever such a dear little girl and boy to make it. And quat, they do everything better than other children, and quat, said she, very complacently. And quat, no wonder they make better snow images, and quat, she sat down again to her work, and made as much haste with it as possible. Because twilight would soon come, and Peony's frock was not yet finished, and grandfather was expected, by railroad, pretty early in the morning. Faster and faster, therefore, went her flying fingers. The children, likewise, kept busily at work in the garden, and still the mother listened. Whenever she could catch a word, 
she was amused to observe how their little imaginations had got mixed up with what they were doing, and carried away by it. They seemed positively to think that the snow child would run about and play with them. And quot, what a nice playmate she will be for us. All winter long, and quot, said Violet, and quot, I hope Papa will not be afraid of her giving us a cold. Shan't you love her dearly, Peony, and quot, and quot, oh yes, and quot, cried Peony, and quot, and I will hug her, and she shall sit down close by me and drink some of my warm milk, and quot, and quot, oh no. Peony, and quot, answered Violet, with grave wisdom, and quot, that will not do at all. Warm milk will not be wholesome for our little snow sister. Little snow people, like her, eat nothing but icicles. No, no, Peony, we must not give her anything warm to drink, and quot, there was a minute or two of silence, for Peony, whose short legs were never weary, had gone on a pilgrimage again to the other side of the garden. All of a sudden, Violet cried out, loudly and joyfully, and quot, look here. Peony, come quickly. A light has been shining on her cheek out of that rose-colored cloud. And the color does not go away. Is not that beautiful, and quot, and quot, yes, it is boti full, and quot, answered, peony, pronouncing the three syllables with deliberate accuracy, and quot, oh violet, only look at her, hair, it is all like gold, and quot, and quot, oh certainly, and quot, said violet, with tranquility, as if, it were very much a matter of course, and quot, that color, you know, comes from the golden clouds that we see up there in the sky. She is almost finished now, but her lips must be made very red, redder than her cheeks. Perhaps, Peony, it will make them red if we both kiss them, and quot. Accordingly, the mother heard two smart little smacks, as if both her children were kissing the snow image on its frozen mouth. But, as this did not seem to make the lips quite red enough, Violet next proposed that the snow child should be invited to kiss Peony's scarlet cheek, and quot, come, it'll snow sister, kiss me, and quot, cried Peony, and quot, there, she has kissed you, and quot, added Violet, and quot, and now her lips are very red, and she blushed a little two, and quat, and quat, oh, what a cold kiss, and quat, cried Peony. Just then, there came a breeze of the pure west wind, sweeping through the garden and rattling the parlor windows. It sounded so wintry, cold, that the mother was about to tap on the window pane with her thimbled finger, to summon the two children in, when they both cried out to her with one voice. The tone was not a tone of surprise, although they were evidently a good deal excited, it appeared rather as if they were very much rejoiced at some event that had now happened, but which they had been looking for, and had reckoned upon all along, and quot, mama, mama, we have finished our little snow sister, and she is running about the garden with us, and quot, and quot, what imaginative little beings my children are, and quot, thought the mother, putting the last few stitches into Peony's frock. And quot, and it is strange, too, that they make me almost as much a child as they themselves are. I can hardly help believing, now, that the snow image has really come to life, and quot, and quot, dear mama, and quot, cried Violet, and quot, pray look out and see what a sweet playmate we have, and quot, the mother, being thus entreated, could no longer delay to look forth from the window. The sun was now gone out of the sky, leaving, however, a rich inheritance of his brightness among those purple and golden clouds, which make the sunsets of winter so magnificent. But there was not the slightest gleam or dazzle, either on the window or on the snow, so that the good lady could look all over the garden, and see 
everything and everybody in it. And what do you think she saw there? Violet and Peony, of course. Her own two darling children. Ah, but whom or what did she see besides? Why, if you will believe me, there was a small figure of a girl, dressed all in white, with rose-tinged cheeks and ringlets of golden hue, playing about the garden with the two children. A stranger though she was, the child seemed to be on as familiar terms with Violet and Peony, and they with her, as if all the three had been playmates during the whole of their little lives. The mother thought to herself that it must certainly be the daughter of one of the neighbors, and that, seeing Violet and Peony in the garden, the child had run across the street to play with them. So this kind lady went to the door, intending to invite the little runaway into her comfortable parlor, for, now that the sunshine was withdrawn, the atmosphere, out of doors, was already growing very cold. But, after opening the house door, she stood an instant on the threshold, hesitating whether she ought to ask the child to come in, or whether she should even speak to her. Indeed, she almost doubted whether it were a real child after all, or only a light wreath of the new fallen snow, blown hither and thither about the garden by the intensely cold west wind. There was certainly something very singular in the aspect of the little stranger. Among all the children of the neighborhood, the lady could remember no such face, with its pure white and delicate rose color, and the golden ringlets tossing about the forehead and cheeks. And as for her dress, which was entirely of white, and fluttering in the breeze, it was such as no reasonable woman would put upon a little girl, when sending her out to play, in the depth of winter. It made this kind and careful mother shiver only to look at those small feet, with nothing in the world on them, except a very thin pair of white slippers. Nevertheless, airily as she was clad, the child seemed to feel not the slightest inconvenience from the cold, but danced so lightly over the snow that the tips of her toes left hardly a print in its surface, while Violet could but just keep pace with her, and Peony's short legs compelled him to lag behind. Once, in the course of their play, the strange child placed herself between Violet and Peony, and taking a hand of each, skipped merrily forward, and they along with her. Almost immediately, however, Peony pulled away his little fist, and began to rub it as if the fingers were tingling with cold, while Violet also released herself, though with less abruptness, gravely, remarking that it was better not to take hold of hands. The white-robed damsel said not a word, but danced about, just as merrily as before. If Violet and Peony did not choose to play with her, she could make just as good a playmate of the brisk and cold west wind, which kept blowing her all about the garden, and took such liberties with her, that they seemed to have been friends for a long time. All this while, the mother stood on the threshold, wondering how a little girl could look so much like a flying snowdrift, or how a snowdrift could look so very like a little girl. She called Violet, and whispered to her. And quot. Violet my darling, what is this child's name? And quot. Asked she. And quot. Does she live near us? And quot. And quot. Why, dearest mama, and quot. Answered. Violet laughing to think that her mother did not comprehend so very plain an affair, and quot. This is our little snow sister whom we have just been making, and quot, and quot. Yes, dear mama, and quot, cried Peony, running to his mother, and looking up simply into her face. And quot, this is our snow image. Is it not a nice, idle child? And quot. At this instant a flock of snowbirds came flitting through the air. As was very natural, they avoided Violet and Peony. But, and this looked strange, they flew at once to the white-robed child, fluttered eagerly about her head, alighted on her shoulders, and seemed to claim her as an old acquaintance. She, on her part, was evidently as glad to see these 
little birds, old winter's grandchildren, as they were to see her, and welcome them by holding out both her hands. Hereupon, they each and all tried to alight on her two palms and ten small fingers and thumbs, crowding one another off, with an immense fluttering of their tiny wings. One dear little bird nestled tenderly in her bosom. Another put its bill to her lips. They were as joyous all the while, and seemed as much in their element, as you may have seen them when sporting with a snowstorm. Violet and Peony stood laughing at this pretty sight, for they enjoyed the merry time which their new playmate was having with these small-winged visitants, almost as much as if they themselves took part in it. And Quat, Violet, and Quat, said her mother, greatly perplexed, and Quat, tell me the truth, without any jest. Who is this little girl? And Quat, and Quat, my darling mama, and Quat, answered. Violet, looking seriously into her mother's face, and apparently surprised that she should need any further explanation, and quot, I have told you truly who she is. It is our little snow image, which Peony and I have been making. Peony will tell you so, as well as I and quot, and quot, yes, mama, and quot. A severated Peony, with much gravity in his crimson little fizz, and quot, this is, it'll snow child. Is not she a nice one? But, mama, her hand is, oh, so very cold, and quat, while mama still hesitated what to think and what to do, the street gate was thrown open, and the father of Violet and Peony appeared, wrapped in a pilot cloth sack, with a fur cap drawn down over his ears, and the thickest of gloves upon his hands. Mr. Lindsay was a middle-aged man, with a weary and yet a happy look in his wind-flushed and frost-pinched face, as if he had been busy all the day long, and was glad to get back to his quiet home. His eyes brightened at the sight of his wife and children. Although he could not help uttering a word or two of surprise, at finding the whole family in the open air, on so bleak a day, and after sunset too. He soon perceived the little white stranger, sporting to and fro in the garden, like a dancing snow wreath, and the flock of snowbirds, fluttering about her head, and quat, pray, what little girl may that be, and quat, inquired this very, sensible man, and quat, surely her mother must be crazy to let her go out in such bitter weather as it, has been today, with only that flimsy white gown and those thin slippers, and quat, and quat, my dear husband, and quat, said his wife, and quat, I know no more about the little thing than you do. Some neighbor's child, I suppose, are violet and peony, and quat, she added, laughing at herself for repeating so absurd a story, and quat, insist that she is nothing but a snow image, which they have been busy about in the garden, almost all the afternoon, and quat, as she said this, the mother, glanced her eyes toward the spot where the children's snow image had been made. What was her surprise, on perceiving that there was not the slightest trace of so much labor, no image at all, no piled up heap of snow, nothing whatever, save the prints of little footsteps around a vacant space, and quat, this is very strange, and quat, said she. And quat, what is strange, dear mother, and quat, asked Violet. And quat, dear father, do not you see how it is? This is our snow image, which Peony and I have made, because we wanted another playmate. Did not we, Peony, and quat, and quat, yes, papa, and quat, said Crimson Peony. And quat, this be our, it'll snow sister. Is she not bow tea full? But she gave me such a cold kiss. And quat, and quat, po, nonsense, children, and quat, cried their good, honest father, who, as we have already intimated, had an exceedingly common sensible way of looking at matters. And quat, do not tell me of making live figures out of snow. Come, wife. 
This little stranger must not stay out in the bleak air a moment longer. We will bring her into the parlor, and you shall give her a supper of warm bread and milk, and make her as comfortable as you can. Meanwhile, I will inquire among the neighbors, or, if necessary, send the city crier about the streets, to give notice of a lost child, and quat. So saying, this honest and very kind-hearted man was going toward the little white damsel, with the best intentions in the world. But Violet and Peony, each seizing their father by the hand, earnestly besought him not to make her come in. And quat, dear father, and quat, cried Violet, putting herself before him, and quat, it is true what I have been telling you. This is our little snow girl, and she cannot live any longer than while she breathes the cold west wind. Do not make her come into the hot room, and quat, and quat, yes, father, and quat, shouted Peony, stamping his little foot, so mightily was he in earnest, and quat, this be nothing but our, it'll snow child. She will not love the hot fire, and quat, and quat, nonsense, children, nonsense, nonsense, and quat, cried the father, half vexed, half laughing at what he considered their foolish obstinacy, and quat, run into the house, this moment, it is too late to play any longer, now, I must take care of this little girl immediately, or she will catch her death a cold, and quat, and quat, husband, dear husband, and quat, said his wife, in a low voice, for she had been looking narrowly at the snow child, and was more perplexed than ever, and quat, there is something very singular in all this. You will think me foolish, but, but, may it not be that some invisible angel has been attracted by the simplicity and good faith with which our children set about their undertaking? May he not have spent an hour of his immortality in playing with those dear little souls? And so the result is what we call a miracle. No, no, do not laugh at me. I see what a foolish thought it is, and quat, and quat, my dear wife, and quat, replied the husband, laughing heartily, and quat, you are as much a child as Violet and Peony, and quat, and in one sense so she was, for all through life she had kept her heart full of childlike simplicity and faith, which was as pure and clear as crystal, and, looking at all matters, through this transparent medium, she sometimes saw truths so profound that other people laughed at them as nonsense and absurdity. But now kind Mr. Lindsay had entered the garden, breaking away from his two children, who still sent their shrill voices after him, beseeching him to let the snow child stay and enjoy herself in the cold west wind. As he approached, the snowbirds took to flight. The little white damsel, also, fled backward, shaking her head, as if to say, and quat, pray, do not touch me, and quat, and roguishly, as it appeared, leading him through the deepest of the snow. Once, the good man stumbled, and floundered down upon his face, so that, gathering himself up, again, with the snow sticking to his rough pilot cloth sack, he looked as white and wintry as a snow image of the largest size. Some of the neighbors, meanwhile, seeing him from their windows, wondered what could possess poor Mr. Lindsay to be running about his garden in pursuit of a snowdrift, which the west wind was driving hither and thither. At length, after a vast deal of trouble, he chased the little stranger into a corner, where she could not possibly escape him. His Wife had been looking on, and, it being nearly twilight, was wonderstruck to observe how the snow child gleamed and sparkled, and how she seemed to shed a glow all round about her, and when driven into the corner, she positively glistened like a star. It was a frosty kind of brightness, too, like that of an icicle in the moonlight. The wife thought it strange that good Mr. Lindsay should see nothing remarkable in the snow child's appearance. And quat, come, you odd little thing, and quat, 
cried the honest man, seizing her by the hand, and quoth, I have caught you at last, and will make you comfortable in spite of yourself. We will put a nice warm pair of worsted stockings on your frozen little feet, and you shall have a good thick shawl to wrap yourself in. Your poor white nose, I am afraid, is actually frostbitten. But we will make it all right. Come along. In. And quat. And so, with a most benevolent smile on his sagacious visage, all purple as it was with the cold, this very well-meaning gentleman took the snow child by the hand and led her towards the house. She followed him, droopingly and reluctant, for all the glow and sparkle was gone out of her figure, and whereas just before she had resembled a bright, frosty, star-gemmed evening, with a crimson gleam on the cold horizon, she now looked as dull and languid as a thaw. As kind Mr. Lindsay led her up the steps of the door, Violet and Peony looked into his face, their eyes full of tears, which froze before they could run down their cheeks, and again entreated him not to bring their snow image into the house. And quat, not bring her in, and quat, exclaimed the kind-hearted man. And quat, why, you are crazy, my little Violet, quite crazy, my small Peony. She is so cold, already, that her hand has almost frozen mine, in spite of my thick gloves. Would you have her, freeze to death? And quat, his wife, as he came up the steps, had been taking another long, earnest, almost awe-stricken gaze at the little white stranger. She hardly knew whether it was a dream or no, but she could not help fancying that she saw the delicate print of Violet's fingers on the child's neck. It looked just as if, while Violet was shaping out the image, she had given it a gentle pat with her hand, and had neglected to smooth the impression quite away. And quat, after all, husband, and quat, said the mother, recurring to her idea that the angels would be as much delighted to play with Violet and Peony as she herself was, and quat, after all, she does look strangely like a snow image. I do believe she is made of snow. And quat. A puff of the west wind blew against the snow child, and again she sparkled like a star. And quat. Snow, and quat. Repeated good Mr. Lindsay. Drawing the reluctant guest over his hospitable threshold. And quat. No wonder she looks like snow. She is half frozen, poor little thing. But a good fire will put everything to rights, and quat, without further talk, and always with the same best intentions, this highly benevolent and common sensible individual led the little white damsel, drooping, 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 more and more out of the frosty air, and into his comfortable parlor. A Heidenberg stove, filled to the brim with intensely Burning anthracite, was sending a bright gleam through the isinglass of its iron door, and causing the vase of water on its top to fume and bubble with excitement. A warm, sultry smell was diffused throughout the room. A thermometer on the wall farthest from the stove stood at 80 degrees. The parlor was hung with red curtains, and covered with a red carpet, and looked just as warm as it felt. The difference betwixt the atmosphere here in the cold, wintry twilight out of doors, was like stepping at once from Nova Zembla to the hottest part of India, or from the North Pole into an oven. Oh, this was a fine place for the little white stranger. The common sensible man placed the snow child on the hearth rug, right in front of the hissing and fuming stove. And quat, now she will be comfortable. And quat, cried Mr. Lindsay, rubbing his hands and looking about him, with the pleasantest smile you ever saw. And quat, make yourself at home, my child. And quat, sad, sad and drooping, looked the little white maiden, as she stood on the hearth rug, with the hot blast of the stove striking through her like a pestilence. Once, she threw a glance wistfully toward the windows, and caught a glimpse, through its red curtains, of the snow-covered roofs, and the stars, 
glimmering frostily, and all the delicious intensity of the cold night. The bleak wind rattled the window panes, as if it were summoning her to come forth. But there stood the snow child, drooping before the hot stove. But the common sensible man saw nothing amiss. And quoth, come wife, and quoth, said he, and quoth, let her have a pair of thick stockings and a woolen shawl or blanket directly, and tell Dora to give her some warm supper as soon as the milk boils. You, Violet and Peony, amuse your little friend. She is out of spirits, you see, at finding herself in a strange place. For my part, I will go around among the neighbors, and find out where she belongs. And quoth, the mother, meanwhile, had gone in search of the shawl and stockings, for her own view of the matter, however subtle and delicate, had given way, as it always did, to the stubborn materialism of her husband. Without heeding the remonstrances of his two children, who still kept murmuring that their little snow sister did not love the warmth, good Mr. Lindsay took his departure, shutting the parlor door carefully behind him. Turning up the collar of his sack over his ears, he emerged from the house and had barely reached the street gate, when he was recalled by the screams of Violet and Peony and the rapping of a thimbled finger against the parlor window. And quot, husband, husband, and quot, cried his wife, showing her horror-stricken face through the window panes. And quot, there is no need of going for the child's parents, and quot, and quot, we told you so, father, and quot, screamed Violet and Peony, as he re-entered the parlor, and quot, you would bring her in, and now are, poor, dear bow-tee full little snow sister is thawed, and quot, and their own sweet little faces were, already dissolved in tears, so that their father, seeing what strange things occasionally happen in, this everyday world, felt not a little anxious lest his children might be going to thaw too. In the utmost perplexity, he demanded an explanation of his wife. She could only reply, that, being summoned to the parlor by the cries of Violet and Peony, she found no trace of the little white maiden, unless it were the remains of a heap of snow, which, while she was gazing at it, melted quite away upon the hearth rug. And quot, and there you see all that is left of it, and quot, added she, pointing to a pool of water in front of the stove. And quot, yes, father, and quot, said Violet looking reproachfully at him, through her tears, and quot, there is all that is left of our dear little snow sister, and quot, and quot, naughty father, and quot, cried Peony, stamping his foot, and, I shudder too say, shaking his little fist at the common sensible man. And quot, we told you how it would be. What, for did you bring her in, and quot, and the Heidenberg stove, through the isinglass of its door, seemed to glare at good Mr. Lindsay, like a red-eyed demon, triumphing in the mischief which it had done. This, you will observe, was one of those rare cases, which yet will occasionally happen where common sense finds itself at fault. The remarkable story of the snow image, though to that sagacious class of people to whom good Mr. Lindsay belongs it may seem but a childish affair, is nevertheless, capable of being moralized in various methods, greatly for their edification. One of its lessons, for instance, might be, that it behooves men, and especially men of benevolence, to Consider well what they are about, and, before acting on their philanthropic purposes, to be quite sure that they comprehend the nature and all the relations of the business in hand. What has been established as an element of good to one being may prove absolute mischief to another, even as the warmth of the parlor was proper enough for children of flesh and blood, like Violet and Peony, though by no means very wholesome, even for them, but involved nothing short of annihilation to the unfortunate snow image. But, after all, there is no teaching anything to wise men of good Mr. Lindsay's stamp.
They know everything, oh, to be sure. Everything that has been. And everything that is, and everything that, by any future possibility, can be. And, should some phenomenon of nature or providence transcend their system, they will not recognize it, even if it 